All right, so this one, 10 and 11, I can't remember if I told you, but they're the same tumor. Same case, actually, just two different areas. I think the morphology is better on this piece. And the next piece is just cool because of the, the bone and its situation to the bone. So here I'll show you case one just to refresh your memory, or piece one. And then here's piece two. So you can see bone here. Does anyone know what bone this is? I didn't tell you any history. What is it? The clivus would be a good idea, but try the other end instead. This is all the way at the other end of the spine. Yeah, it's actually at the very tip of the sacrum. It's the coccyx. Yep. I mean, isn't that an amazing section? I don't think I've ever seen a section, you know, this is anterior, posterior section, kind of sagittal, right through the coccyx. And you can even see here is the very end of the coccyx. And here is uh, the, the fibrous, uh, the fiber cartilage of the disc. Isn't that amazing? So fascinating. And you can see that the tumor is emanating out from, I mean, it honestly looks like it's out here growing into the bone, but because we know that this probably arises from right around here, you can see the tumor in the bone itself and then making a large mass out here in the soft tissue. So now, now that we've looked at that one, so that is just truly an amazing section. One of the most fascinating sections I've gotten my collection perhaps just because of the, uh, the anatomic uh, orientation. But let's go back to this piece because I think the, the features are much more classic here. So what is this uh, tumor? Yeah, that's a chordoma, which is exactly why you guys went straight for clivus because the clivus and the sacrococcygeal area is the classic site for chordomas, right? They arise at either the, the distal or proximal end of the spine, right? And the idea is that the notochord embryologically that as it helps form the spine and spinal cord areas. And as that all forms together in the embryology of that is way more than I can remember. But the idea is that maybe some cells get left at the end, at either end, and that those are the precursors that give rise to uh, chordomas. And that's a pretty cool idea. And it seems to probably have some legitimacy, but we do now know that chordomas can arise in other locations. I, I co-authored a paper uh, with Dr. Weiss and some others about uh, chordomas in um, outside of the axial skeleton and in soft tissue. And we even saw some of the extremity. I saw, I've seen a case in the ankle, um, in the soft tissue of the ankle before. And uh, so that was kind of an interesting study that it's very, very rare, but we, we do occasionally see them at other sites. So it's important to keep that in mind. And also, if you see things that look like a chordoma in another site, always remember what other tumor can look a lot like chordoma. Any takers? I'll give you a hint. It, it used to be in the old times called paracordoma because it looked like a chordoma, but was actually in the periphery of the body, not at the, the axial spine or the axial skeleton spine area. So the, the paracordomas, I think most people now accept that they're actually a form of myoepithelioma, a myoepithelioma that has cordoid features, that has kind of cells that look like chordoma. So here's the things that helped me. And I learned this uh, in residency from one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Connolly. Uh, I think he said that, you know, from low power, before you go looking for physiliferous cells, which I know is what you want to find because they're bubbly and really interesting looking. But before you do that, chordomas are often multi-nodular like this, and they have fibrous septations dividing the different lobules. The individual lobules themselves usually have a prominent myxoid background. And then as you go closer, the cells in there are variably epithelioid to kind of vacuolated and clear, and it can run a range. I've seen ones that were very epithelioid, other ones that were very vacuolated and almost like kind of adipocyte looking. And then of course the multivacuolated bubbly physiliferous cells, which we'll look at in a second. But those cells, clear to epithelioid, are arranged in kind of chains and cords. I think we can kind of doubly use the word cord here. They can sometimes have sheet-like areas and nests, but they often have a cord-like pattern. And I think this is a good example of the kind of cords, the rows, they're kind of lining up in, in you know irregular kind of um, elongated, um, uh, rows and, and are connecting up to their neighbors. And see, these are look much more pink uh, epithelioid cells, and then uh, other cells look much more vacuolated. And then here you can see the multivacuolated cell, the physiliferous cell, which I think stems from a Greek word for bubbly or something, if I recall. And so uh, this is a good example of chordoma. You can have a variable amount of atypia. Sometimes they're very bland. I've seen some that are atypical. Sometimes they can even be like anaplastic or sarcomatoid in appearance and really have like you know, spindled cellular areas that are sarcoma-like. I've seen that before too. And unfortunately, these are problematic tumors because 
Um, sometimes they metastasize, but, but the bigger problem is because of the, the area, they're either usually at the base of the skull or in the pelvis, and they can be kind of relentless and recur again and again. It can be very difficult to manage and get them out. They cause, you know, compression effect on the other structures. I've seen people have hemipelvectomies uh, for them. This, this patient here, had, you know, had the, a sacrectomy and, you know, significant problems that come with that, with those surgeries. And I've met some patients that had chordoma through, through working with patient support groups and um, yeah, certainly a, a problematic uh, tumor to have, and one that I, I think that the patient support groups actually have really pushed for more research to be done, and they've worked on funding the research, which I think is really fascinating and awesome to see patients, you know, um, advocate for their own health that way. So, um, yeah, so if you, the physoliferous cells are often there, but I don't feel like you have to have them. And then what's the classic immunophenotype uh, for, um, for chordoma? They co-express what and what? Yeah, brachyuri is the buzzword, right? T brachyuri. I think the T is there. I don't know what the T means, but brachyuri is the. Yes, brachyuri is a nuclear stain that is a very good, um, as far as I know, uh, very sensitive and specific stain. Maybe there's other stuff that stains with it, but the last time I checked, it was pretty much only chordoma that I can recall. So if you think you might have a chordoma in soft tissue and you can't tell apart from a, a myothelioma, brachyuri should solve that problem for you right away. Yes, the important thing I want you to remember, though, is that co-expression of keratin and S100 is not very common in human tumors, but one thing that consistently does it in the majority of cases, I've seen exceptions to this, but it usually is co-expression of keratin and S100 in chordomas, okay? So that's good. And the other thing is myoepithelial cells, both normal and neoplastic, co-express keratin and S100. And in fact, when you're looking at myoepithelial tumors of bone or soft tissue, which are rare but do occur, the, the normal myoepithelial markers that you would use like in breast pathology are not very sensitive. A lot of the myoepithelial tumors are negative for them. But keratin and S100 co-expression is, is, is one of the best reproducible things that the vast majority of myoepithelial tumors will have keratin or sometimes EMA instead co-express with S100. So I think that that's really important to know those two things that can do that. That's good. And I think there may be a couple others. Occasionally, some types of carcinoma can express S100. I think I've heard of, I want to say I've heard of some breast carcinomas expressing S100. I don't know if I've seen one, but I, I've heard that it can happen. So, okay. Good. Cordoma, any other questions? Oh, the, the idea that these look like the chain of a bicycle. That's kind of cool. I like that. Yeah, because it kind of loops around, right? So I wanted to give a, a shout out um, while I was uh, explaining to the McGill residents about the chains and cords of chordoma. I learned from uh, Dr. Aisha Baig, uh, the a resident at McGill, that their mentor in soft tissue, Dr. Sung Mi Jung, um, likens the uh, kind of curving cord shape of the chordoma cells to a bicycle chain. And it's I love that analogy. It's so cool. You can see these bulging kind of uh, expansions of the little cord and chain and it does wrap around so uh, thanks very much for that awesome uh, visual tip Dr. Jung and Dr. Baig thank you for letting me know about this and also for compiling these beautiful pictures for me to add in um, when I was editing this video and here's another area from the same tumor um, and you can see kind of a linear uh, bicycle chain look really cool and I, I'm really thankful to learn that and I'm uh, happy that you took the time to uh, to tell me this and to make these photos for me. All right. I like that. I, thank you. Yeah, I love, I love, that's why I always talk about my mentors is I just feel like they've given me so much, you know, and, and I feel like it's kind of stealing somehow to reuse all the things they've taught me and, and somehow put them out as my own. And also I just feel like that adds, I loved when my mentors told me the things that their mentors taught them and when they told me the story. So I feel like those stories are the part of pathology that sometimes gets lost in the sands of time. And maybe it doesn't necessarily matter for everyday diagnosis, but I feel like it adds kind of a richness to the legacy of our field. And um, like Mark Edgar said, he's like, oh, this stuff doesn't, a lot of this doesn't really matter. Although I kind of disagree. There are definitely times some of the subtle clues he's taught me have helped me in practice um, for diagnostic stuff and the same for Dr. Weiss. Um, but but uh, he's but Mark said, yeah, you know, this adds kind of a granularity, a texture to, to learning pathology. And it certainly makes it really fun, I think. So so that's really cool. And I love I love learning uh, those those visual analogies. One day, maybe when I retire, I'll make a book of all the different visual patterns that people have come up with. Or maybe we can just do it on Twitter and I'll send you some help. Okay.